Tom Franklin is the author of three books of fiction set in rural, sometimes violent, South Alabama. I spoke with Tom Franklin at the J.D. Williams Library at the University of Mississippi in Oxford. Tommy, it's good to see you again. It's good to be back. I remember the last time we spoke, it must have been, oh my goodness, seven or eight years ago anyway. Yeah, I think it was 99. You had just published Poachers. Poachers right. was out and for sale and doing well. It did do well, didn't it? I think it did fairly well for a, a collection of stories by an unknown writer. Right. But it was a prize winner. It did, yeah, it was. The uh, title novella won the Edgar Allan Poe Award for Best Mystery Short Story. And I remember even asking you about that at the time. It, it, it isn't exactly a mystery story. It's a no, and kind I of didn't revenge what, story. I didn't know what the Edgar Allan Poe Award was at the time. Um, I got a phone call and said, you know, you've been nominated for this award. And I thought, great. How much does it pay? And they said, it doesn't pay anything, but it's, but it's prestigious. Well, that was a long time ago. And since then, there have been two more books. And you've moved twice, I think. But now we're at Ole Miss. Right. We're here how in long Oxford. Have you, how long have you been here? We arrived here in 2001. Oh, so this is your sixth year? Yeah. Oh, well, you're settled all in, aren't you? And we're in our third house. We've now bought a house here, and we hope to stay here for good. <laughs> Bethann and I do. You do? This, yeah. this seems to you permanent. Yeah, knock wood. All right, and what do you do here? Uh, Bethann is uh, associate professor of poetry. She's now got tenure, and I am, they call me a writer in residence. We also have Barry and Hannah, who is the <laughs> writer in residence. <laughs> We have the John and Renee Grisham writer in residence every year. That changes. Mm -hmm. That's what I was in 2001. Uh, that and was your entry here. Yes. We just we came and never left. Right. Are you teaching? Yes. How much do they ask you to teach? They know my limitations. They get, <laughs> give me one class per semester. <laughs> Actually, that's plenty. It is plenty. It I is mean, plenty. You can, if you had one student per semester and you did it right, it would take plenty of time. That's right. You, this is Mississippi, but... South Alabama is your, is your territory. It was for poachers. And then if you move just a little bit north up to Clark County, you get your first full-length novel, Hell, Hell at the, the Breach. Breach yeah. <clears throat> Tell me the time, uh, well, the time, the place obviously is around uh, Clark County and, and uh, what's the town? Uh, uh, several. They're called Coffeeville, and then it, uh, it's set in a place called Mitchum's Beat, and a, a beat you know, was a voting district. Right. It was just um, part of the part of Clark County that was really mean and lawless, mostly planters, uh, farmers, mostly really poor. What's the year for that? Uh, in, in in real life, eighteen ninety two and three uh, was where most of the events uh -huh. uh, were centered, and uh, I moved it a few years ahead. For, um, for, you know, for writerly reasons. You moved it up into the 20th century? No, I moved it to 1897, five years. Oh, all right. Yeah. These were the, these got known by historians as the Clark County Wars. <clears throat> mm -hmm. And there, there was, uh, what, a, a, what would you call it, a historical study. It was a, a monograph, well, it wasn't a monograph because two people wrote it, but there was Three a book. Three people wrote it. Three people. There, were, well, there was a book about the Clark County Wars. Yes. It's called the Mitchum Beat of Clark County, uh, uh, rather the Mitchum War of Clark County, uh, Clark County Alabama. Uh, Hardy Jackson, who's a professor of history up at Jacksonville State, uh, did the writing in collaboration with Joyce Burridge, who um, mm -hmm. was my 11th grade English teacher, oh. and, and is a local <laughs> historian, and Jim Cox, who's the editor of the Clark County Democrat, the paper there in uh, and that's Grove the, Hill. And that's the historical version. The, yes. The, presumably they get it right. They, um, I think they try as best they could. They talked to everyone that they could find who had a story, and, and a lot of people in Clark County have stories about it. What's funny though is after the book came out and I began doing readings here and there, at nearly every reading someone would come up and say, they should have talked to me. I have another story that they don't even know about. I don't know if those stories are true or if everyone tr claims to have one. I don't know, but a lot of, you know, it, it's famous in that county and a lot of people I think lay claim to it. Right. Well, who was at war with whom? Uh, this is this this thing is this thing is happening at the tail end of the nineteenth century. From our vantage point, this is primitive. 
Right. All these people are more or less from our historical 115 year distance. They all look alike. They're all late 19th century, very rural Alabamians, and yet they they managed to, to, to go to war against each other. What, what were they fighting about? It was class. It, uh, there were poor, very poor sharecroppers uh, up against people who they perceived to be wealthy, who were from town, who weren't actually wealthy at all. You know, right. in, in the research that I did, what I found was that you know, the, the markets in New York were setting the cotton prices, and that just trickled back down eventually, of course, to the farmer, you know, for the people who grew the cotton. Yeah. So I, you know, I blame New York for it, for the <laughs> whole thing. Good, good. Yeah. What, I, what I was struck by was well, several things about that book, but one of the things that struck me about that book is that the actual spark, the incident, which begins the, the bloodbath, was basically an error, a, a kind of a mistake. Some kid shoots the wrong person, it's an acci accident, well, you know, call it what you will. But the situation had to be perfectly right for that spark to light the, the right. blaze that, that it does. Uh, your tensions have been building for years. And uh, in real life, a, a local politician was murdered. Um, uh -huh. a, a country politician had gone into town, into Coffeeville, to debate a town politician. Arguably, the country politician won. And um, he then complained of stomach, a stomachache, I believe, and talked to his opponent, who was a doctor, was medicated and on his way home died. So his friends naturally thought he had been poisoned by the doctor. And th this was really, that was the spark. Um, I had trouble writing that book. It took me about five years to write it. And a lot of the trouble came from trying to figure out, you know, the, the unknowable. Why did these people do this? Why did these people do that? And it, it finally occurred to me, talking with my wife, Beth Ann, who's um, a great editor for me and also a great soundboard off, you know, off which to bounce ideas, it occurred to us that if s someone were um, involved in that spark, you know, if the spark uh, was something I could, I could nail down, that might be a better, uh, an access way into the story that I wanted to tell about those events. You know, this was going to be my version mm -hmm. of that war. And what I learned in, in the research is that there are a lot of versions. A lot of people have their ideas about it. So um, the reason it took me so long to get it going was I was trying to stay faithful to everybody. I was trying to stay faithful to um, Hardy Jackson's book about it mm -hmm. and to um, Joyce Burge's account of it. And uh, I just couldn't do it. And finally, I, um, I began changing people's ages. Two of the principal characters, one is uh, a guy named, was a guy named Mac Burke in real life. He was in his early 30s. Another was a, a sheriff named William Waite, who was in his late 20s. I made Burke in a 15 and Waite early 60s. Right. And that move, I didn't know it at the time, but it really helped me to own the characters. They became my people instead of um, my versions of real people. And I felt I could then take liberties with them and make them do what I needed them to do. Right. And I made Mac Burke, who was on the side of the poor farmers. First, I made him an orphan, and then I um, made him and his brother try to had them try to rob someone. And this mm -hmm. person that they tried to rob became that politician on his way home from town mm -hmm. after that debate. And they're just going to try to rob him. He's in fact a friend of theirs, but they don't know it because it's so dark at night. They try to stop him. He's accidentally murdered, and then the story takes off from there. So what that did, it made Mac Burke. Uh, the catalyst for everything, right? For everything, and that, and, and that, and that helped me into it in a really good yeah. way. I think your other decision is a good one too, to make the sheriff not merely more mature, but actually a little, a little tired. I think yeah. that sheriff is is um, is a little disgusted. He's a little burned out. Absolutely, this, he's come to the end of his career as sheriff. I think. So the, the people in the country who are really, really poor are mad at the storekeepers and the bankers because they're slightly less poor. Yeah, and, and, and the merchants from town have their own problems. They owe money too. So they have to foreclose to, or, or they're going to be right. foreclosed upon. So it just trickles down. And, but uh, the people at the bottom are the people who are going to be affected the most, of course. The level of violence in that book, the, the amount of cruelty, <clears throat> bordering at, at moments on 
sadism almost, and what people do to each other in that book is just frightful. But uh, well, in real life, what they did to each other was frightful. Was as it? Well, yeah, they shot <laughs> one man. Um, ultimately, a mob from town. It's a, a posse if, on the town side. It's a mob on the countryside. But a mob rode into Mitcham Beat and shot men. Some innocent, some not innocent. Some we don't know to this day if they were guilty or innocent. They shot one man so many times, he had six holes and a plug of tobacco in his shirt pocket. His arms came loose. I mean, that's, that's horrific violence. I couldn't have made that up. <clears throat> now, you know, we all at some point in our misspent youth studied romantic poetry and the cult of the child, the innocence of the young. Children in your books are, are, are often vile. In, in that book, in fact, there are, there are children who are, who are extraordinarily cruel. Um, and they, in fact, I think the most sadistic scene in the book is, uh, the most un unnerving scene in the book is, is a couple of kids tormenting a dying man. Right. Do you have an anti-romantic theory, Tommy? <laughs> children are not all that <laughs> innocent? Children are awful. I mean, I was one. I, uh, you were one. Uh, they're cruel. Uh-huh. You know, and, and these three kids, these three boys, have come out of this war. They have survived it. Their parents are both dead. In, in, in essence, they're, they're orphans. I, I hope someone will find them. But they're, they're, they're these wild kids, and the man they kill is the most violent character in the novel. Yes, he deserves he most of what he gets. I think he deserves all of what he gets. Nobody <laughs> deserves all of what he gets. <laughs> you know, but that, that's the kind of thing that, that as, you know, as I was uh, writing it, surprised uh -huh. me and you know uh, the boys did that on their own that sounds new agey or, or, or strange but you know but a as you're writing things often happen uh, between your head and your hands and that happened as those boys began to you know the man is lying there he's been shot in uh, through a spine and maybe one other place he's been shot twice I forget where now and he's lying there and he opens his eye and he can't move and I was interested in the idea that all he was was what he could see he, he couldn't feel anything, and he had, oh, he shot through the eye, so he only has one eye. That's what it was. He's reduced to one eye, and he's lying there watching the sky, and then a boy's face poked itself in there. That's kind of funny, I thought. And then I thought, what would those boys do without any kind of law, any kind of uh, guidance? What would they do? And, and what they began to do was torture the dying man. Mm -hmm. do, does something like Lord of the Flies which is the most famous, I guess, anti-romantic version of what happens if you leave boys alone without adult supervision. Does something like that play into your, your thinking about children? Uh, maybe subconsciously. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't think it, think it did consciously. Well, you know, that, I mean, they, they're on an island alone and there's no supervision. Right. And they go savage. Yeah. Pretty, it's, pretty the, quickly. The, the, the same thing as Kid Nation now, right? When, <laughs> That's yeah, I guess. reality TV. <laughs> I guess. But, yeah, but, but I did this, had the, in a way the same thing with poachers. Uh, the three, there were three boys in that, mm -hmm. and they were left basically to raise themselves. Mm -hmm. So I think um, that's something that, that I deal with maybe without even realizing it. My agent, Nat Sobel, uh, up in New York, is really a good reader, and he told me my own theme uh, probably about a year ago. Mm -hmm. He said, what I write about, whether I know it or not, and I didn't, was were, were the innocents being thrust into a world of violence. Mm -hmm. And that's in every book, I, you know, if, if I look back. Right. Well, you know you have more orphans than Charles Dickens. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the books are full of, yeah. of people, feral, or semi-feral children who are basically raising themselves in some fashion or other. There are some innocents, so to speak, in this book, though, that, that might need a word, and that is, the war, the, the, the Mitchum Wars, the Clark County Wars, are white townspeople against white country people. But there are African Americans. There are, there are blacks scattered around Clark County and in yeah. that neighborhood. And th they're innocent of basically of, of, of all wrongdoing in this novel, except that they suffer anyway. Are you trying to make any, what, what, what's the, they're caught in the crossfire? I mean, how do you, how do you how do you talk about what happens to them just by virtue of simply being there? I think with them it was, um, the, 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 my easy cowardly answer is that the novel was hard to write. And uh, people, you know, 
were really um, fervently into politics then. It affected people much more now than you know, uh, mm -hmm. much more then than now, uh, in the fact that they were had their hands in the dirt, and if if what they brought out of the dirt didn't pay them money, they weren't going to survive. So they needed people who cared about them to go to Montgomery, or even you know to to um, the Grove Hill, the capital, uh, um, capital, the uh, county seat. Thank you, county seat. Sure, yeah. I'm glad you're here for that. Uh, um, <laughs> I try to be helpful. <laughs> and so part of it on my part was in writing a first novel. You know, the politics kept crowding. Politics kept crowding in, and race kept crowding in. There were more, I think, racial overtones than I dealt with. I finally decided I've got to put this aside and keep it about class between poor whites and less poor whites. Yes, I think those were just practical decisions. Yeah, I think it is a novel about class. It's just that if you're in Alabama, where where at that point one third of the population would have been black, there's just no way to imagine that they're not there. Well, they're also, well, uh, often they're not there. I mean, they're not looked at or noticed. You right. know, they're pushed, on, pushed right. aside. And I think that uh, that was uh, an aspect that, that happened that I didn't quite mean to happen or, or wasn't aware of. Right. They're on nobody's side, so therefore they can be victimized by anybody right. in that context. And, and a lot of them did leave the area for fear of their lives. I'll bet. So uh, I think I would have, too. That, that was convenient for me. Right. right. Let's, let's jump ahead to Smunk, S-M-O-N-K. Your hero, if yeah. hero, hero, what a word, wow. The major figure in that novel is, is Smunk. Right. I, th I, th I think the word protagonist was invented for a character <laughs> like Smunk. Yes, you could have a novel about Hitler and he would still be yeah. the protagonist. That, that, that sound, Smunk, came from somewhere. It came from somewhere in your family, right? It came from my daughter. What did she do? How did, how did she make the sound, Smunk? She and I were driving home one night from somewhere, uh -huh. and we sm driving through, and we smelled a skunk. She said, what's that smell? And I said, it's uh -huh. a skunk. She said, what's a skunk? She was three. I told her what a skunk was. And the next day, she said, let's be smunks today, Daddy. I thought, that's a great word, smunk. I'm going to keep it. I wrote it down. And, and never with a U for some reason, always with an O. Okay. S-M-O-N-K. It just, it just seemed better that way. All right. What would you say to the notion that Smunk is like a superhero in the sense of being impossible to kill, like Superman or one of these creatures, you know? I, I, I'm amazed at how many times he is shot and stabbed and <laughs> set on fire, what have you. What's going on there? Why, why is Smunk sort of um, uh, extra natural? Well, the whole book is extra natural. It, it, it's in, in a way, it's, um, it, I think it would be a, gra a good graphic novel. I think it's so over okay. the top. You know, I always meant for it to be uh, over the top. So he's over the top, and he, he's, you know, it's titular character. Um, he should be as over the top as anybody. And he isn't quite human. He is um, something else. Yes. And, and <laughs> so he won't live as long. He has a shorter lifespan, but, but while he's here, he's tougher and harder to kill than anybody else. You like him in some way? Are you? Oh, I love him. I adore him. Really? I wish I, you know, in some way, wish I was smunk. Mm. Because he is always on top of things. He knows uh, that in the room, he is the toughest man. He'll be the last man standing. Well, he may have a short lifespan, as you say, but everyone around him has a much shorter lifespan. Yeah. <laughs> when he, leave, <laughs> he leaves the room, everybody's dead. That There's also a, a, well, heroin. Heroin's just not a good word here. There's a female in this novel who is about as dangerous a creature as I've read about in years. What, what, I forgot her name. It's, it's e Eva it, Evangeline. Eva, that's Eva Evangeline. Where did she come from? I mean, she's a killer. Yeah, you know, it's funny. With the, that book was such a different book to write than Hell at the Breach was. Hell at the Breach was five hellish years of writing. Am I trying to find out uh -huh. about these characters and trying to figure them out? In fact, it was three and a half years of pretty much non-writing. until and, and when I changed the ages, I remember I was in Oxford at that point. So I probably wrote five times as much in in a year and a half in Oxford as I did in Illinois and uh, Alabama and the other places I'd lived before that. Uh, but it really was a get in there and just fight to write a scene kind of day. Mm -hmm. Smunk 
wrote itself really quickly. When I, when I, I had the name, I then sat down to begin to write, and um, I agreed to be in a project called Arts and Letters, where a visual artist was given something from me that he read, yeah. and um, whatever he read made him create uh, a sculpture about this tall. It's a beer mug, and it, it's a really horrific looking man with a big nose, moles and everything, a deep set eyes, and a cigarette hanging out of his mouth. His tongue comes out and around and goes in his nose. That's the handle of the mug. Whatever this guy read of mine, this is what he made. They sent me this <laughs> mug and said, write something in response to this. So I put the mug on my computer, looked at it for a while, thought, what am I going to write? Then I realized, hey, I'll call him Smunk. And then I began listing his ailments, uh, you know, I, malaria, syphilis, <laughs> every, gonorrhea, everything else, every ailment I could think of he had uh, to, to give him, I gave him. Then I began listing his weapons. I thought a guy like this would have to be well armed. And suddenly I'd written what became a short story called Smunk Gets Out Alive, which you put in that, uh, in Climbing Mount Chia. Yeah. And um, I sent it to a friend of mine, Kathy Pores, at Algonquin Books, and Kathy said to me, this is the opening of a novel. And I had no idea where it would go as a novel. And my, our mutual friend, William Gay, said the same thing. Mm -hmm. This is chapter one. What happens in chapter two? Mm -hmm. I had no idea, and a couple of months passed. I always take showers in the dark so I can think and not be distracted by things like my hands or soap. And, and so, more than you wanted to know, I'm sorry. Oh, we'll, we'll deal so with that later. <laughs> in, in, in my dark shower, yes. um, I suddenly came up with a line, and the line was uh, about Eva Evangeline, a name I had never considered, and it, something about her that I won't tell, because it gives something away in the book. Yeah, it looks like a typo when you first see it, Yeah, it, the name. Because Evangeline is a, a common name. Yeah. And if I, maybe I should have changed it, I don't know, because nobody can pronounce it. But suddenly I, I had a, different, a second character, and the, that character wrote herself very quickly. Suddenly I had 12 or 15 pages about her, and then out of nowhere burst in a group of people, a group of men called the Christian deputies. Wonderful. And as they appeared, they're a creation. They are a creation. With their as, coats. And as they appeared in the text of the novel, that's as they appeared to me. And so this it, this was exactly the opposite of Hell at the Breach, where I did a very first draft, a very quick first draft, 200 pages, you know, in a real short amount of time, um, and then spent the next year and a half rearranging it and rewriting the whole second half, figuring out what I really had. Right. Smunk is set. When and where? Smunk is uh, 1911 in Clark County, but it could be almost anywhere, anytime. It's 1911 only because I needed to have a machine gun in there. I have a, two quick questions. Well, actually, one quick question before I, before I ask you what you're up to now. And that is, in, I, I've heard you read many times, and when you read something that's particularly viciously violent, the audience laughs. <laughs> they find it, well, I don't know what they find it, but they laugh. Why do they laugh? I think it makes them uncomfortable. Uh huh. And my, and my favorite example of this is a story that I wrote called Nap Time, which is about a couple who have a colicky baby. Friends of ours had a colicky baby, and they would just tell us horror stories about this poor kid screaming hours every day. You know, we've had two easy children, Beth Ann <laughs> and I have. But I began thinking, what would we, what, you know, it was hard enough with a good child. How would it have been with a bad child? And what would they think about? And would they think about, injuring this child, because if, if this thing is screaming, 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 sooner or later you got to think, just throw it away. And so I read this story sometimes, and the, couple, the couple's lying there in bed, and they talk about harming their baby. Do you ever think about dropping him? And the, the wife says, yes. And, and when I read it, people laugh. And it's a really uncomfortable yes. kind of laughter. Well, and the parents be, always laugh. It can't be born. It's too terrible. You have to laugh. Yeah. Well, this is, you know, I've often thought when reading your work that there, you're in a kind of tradition, whether, whether it's conscious or unconscious, and it comes down from certain Snopes's on the one hand and a little Cormac McCarthy, but a little Erskine Caldwell as well. People, people read God's Little Acre and Tobacco Road and they couldn't stand it and they laughed and thought it was a comedy, but it wasn't. Right. We only have one minute. You're writing a book, you're halfway finished. When and where is it set? I'm writing a contemporary novel now. Oh, good. It, so it's set right now, again, in Clark County, in Grove Hill. But I've got a title that I really like. That's a Mississippi title, Crooked Letter, Crooked Letter. 
I want to use that title, but I may not be able to make it work for this novel. But I don't want to do another historical one for a while. The first two were historical. I don't want to be pigeonholed as that. Mm -hmm. um, so th this one, I'm not sure yet what it is. I've got ideas about what it is mm -hmm. and a lot of pages. But it, it'll, it'll turn into what it's going to turn into. But it's into. Too, a 21st century novel. Yeah. yeah that sounds like science fiction almost because uh, <laughs> we've just crossed into that. But <laughs> right. it, it is set now. Good. But, Good. but parts of it are going to be set back in the 1970s. So it'll be, two, it'll be a part in the 1970s and a part right. 2007 ish. Well, first of all, you have a better chance of selling it to the movies. And second, when you finish it, we'll sit again and talk again. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you.